Hi, I'm Faraz Khan and welcome to Drag and Drop Low Code Unplugged, the podcast where we explore the game-changing impact of low code in software development. Join me in insightful conversations with IT leaders and passionate low code enthusiasts who are at the forefront of this digital evolution. Together we'll explore how early adoption of low code is giving businesses a competitive edge on a global scale. We'll discuss its impact on software development, dissect its role in transforming businesses and uncover the ways in which it's reshaping career trajectories. So whether you're a seasoned IT professional or a curious enthusiast, be sure to tune in as we share success stories and unravel the mysteries of low code. Subscribe now and stay tuned for a front row seat to the revolution that's shaping the future of technology. So let's go. Hi, Mitchell. How are you? Hi, Faraz. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to be a guest on the podcast. Yeah, happy to be here. It's um, I've seen a lot of your stuff on LinkedIn, and um, I thought it was about time to to get you on and you know hear your insights and views live. Good to hear that my uh, exploits have uh, taken notice, and uh, I'm finally here. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, it'd be good to start with um, you giving us a bit of a background to yourself, who you are, where you're from. Yeah, I'm uh, Mitchell Moll. I'm from the Netherlands, Amersfoort. Um, I've been a developer for the past 18 years, pretty much since I uh, uh, started developing stuff at school and then eventually university. Um, started off as a high coder uh, and eventually rolled into the low code market, which was Bendix and never left that anymore. Yeah, yeah. And when what um, when you were working with traditional kind of what what stack were you working with? Were you working with a few things or were you focused on one? Yeah, I started off with Java because that's pretty much the the stuff that my teachers knew. Yeah, yeah, okay. Write <laughs> PHP, but they kind of failed, so uh, yeah. went back to Java. Um, and then eventually rolled into Cold Fusion, which mm. was the, the stack that um, my first employer used, mm. and they were really happy about it. They don't no longer use it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and it was always focused at web applications. So yeah. um, I had a f- couple of applications that ran on desktop, and I did some stuff with Android, etc. But primarily um, uh, websites or web applications. Um, and I did pretty much the same thing as I did now that I, what I'm doing in low code, which is mm. high code. Okay, fine. And when was it that you were kind of first exposed to low code? When I moved to a new employer and they said, yeah. well, we're doing this thing internally and it's called Mendix and we're trying to sell this to other potential customers. And here we have a project for you. Good luck. Figure it yeah. out. <laughs> uh, and this was with Mendix 2. Dot something um uh, so really early stages yeah um, and it had its advantages already uh, but definitely still a lot of high code as well mm-hmm. if you wanted to do some more complex things like generating a document or yeah. calling a rest service or stuff like that um but it had potential and i quickly moved on to a project with men next tree and that was definitely way way better yeah yeah and you know when you, as, as you were someone coming from high code you know, when you were a high coder, were you someone who kind of loved coding or or was that kind of when you discovered low code, you were like, actually, this could make my job much easier? Um, a, a bit of both. Um, I was definitely a coder that liked coding. Um, I wasn't a Linux geek or anything like that Ooh. because, well, I, I learned DOS, Windows, etc. And I like yeah. the simplicity of that. Um, but I've always liked tinkering with software, with code, and building something from scratch is perfectly fine. Uh, but I also saw the potential of uh, low code in the sense that I didn't have to worry about those things that I didn't really want to work on, like the mm-hmm. basics of how to log on, or uh, basic logging, or um, basic framework parts of uh, building a page. And I saw that there were some compromises to be made with low code that I probably could have done more optimal or efficient with high code, but they were uh, minor compared to the efficiencies that you made and being able to deliver the solution much quicker to the customer and also visualize it, which is usually the difficult part also when building high code, that it takes a bit of time and then requirements have changed or expectations are misaligned and then it takes more time to get there. 
Yeah. And, you know, when you were kind of, you know, because it was so long ago, you know, you've been using Mendex quite a while. At that time, you know, was there any kind of, even though, you, you know, you start a new job and you, you, were, you were working with Mendex, you know, at the time, you know, Mendex wasn't probably that well known. So, you know, what was your kind of personal thought? Did you have any thought process that, okay, yes, this platform's great, but for my career, is this going to take me in the right direction? Well, the employer I chose or started working for definitely had the potential to take my career in the right direction. And I was fairly young, so I trusted yeah. that they made a the right decision. I was uh, surrounded by smart people that also mm -hmm. fully bought into it. And we could deliver what we needed to the customer um, and more. Because uh, one of the first projects I worked on was alongside a Microsoft Dynamics team who had to do a lot of high code to okay. make the likes of dynamics project work. And in the end, when we made up the, uh, uh, the budget or the after uh, credits, we noticed that we did like 70% more work than we should have. And they did about 50% less because wow. we took over a bunch of stuff uh, to speed up the development with mm -hmm. Bendix. Well, okay. And, you know, um, now it's been, you know, you're down the line and, you know, you're part of Blue Green Solutions. Can you give us a bit of background into obviously how it led to that and kind of, you know, your involvement in the business? Yeah, so I continued working for that uh, first employer with Mendix for two years. Then I got a, a nice offer I couldn't refuse from a startup building a product with Mendix, um, promising mountains and, and more. Um, they had a very interesting product, uh, product, a very nice team, but they didn't really move towards a way where we would really uh, skyrocket. So at some point, uh, my past caught up with me. I was already doing some freelancing uh, a couple of years back in, on ColdFusion, and a customer wanted me to continue doing that. So I went back to my old high coder roots, yeah. freelancing, but that gave me the opportunity to look around. Um, and then eventually I got in contact with some major customers or major potential customers mm -hmm. on the Gold Fusion, uh, sorry, on the Locos Mendix platform again. And from there on out, I continued freelancing for eight years until along the way I got Leon into freelancing, um, one of the actual co-founders of Blue Green. Yeah. Um, he then wanted to build it out a bit more than just uh, chasing hours and always being the expert in the room and ne never right. having a team to back you up. Um, but I just had a kid, was renovating the house and it was a little bit too much. Uh, but a year later, I settled a little bit. Um, uh, Leon found Eric and we started talking and I joined Blue Green as a co-owner. Yeah. And, you know, what do you think kind of now, you know, that you've been in the business and you're an independent contractor for a while, you know, obviously there's a transition, you know, you're working for yourself, doing very flexible. Now you've obviously managing a business. You have to wear a few hats, right? So, you know, could you tell us about kind of that transition and how you found it? Well, obviously it helped that Blue Green had already gone through some of the whirlwinds that starting a business uh, mm. goes through and Eric and, and Leon and some of my colleagues already knew what they were doing. Uh, but it definitely was a transition of having to just take care of yourself, essentially, um, even though I have led teams and but that was always I, I wasn't responsible for their mortgage, for example, Yeah, yeah. Um, to actually being uh, part of the employer group. Um, but because we have a fairly non-manager type hierarchy yeah. um, and a lot of smart people over mm -hmm. at Blue Green, that worked really well, I mean, there's stuff that you have to take care of that you don't have to take care of when you're a freelancer or um, or a employer employee. But that's mostly accounting, marketing, and uh, taking care of taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, yeah. <laughs> and obviously, talking about all those things that you do, you know, outside of your day, and you know, we we touched on it earlier about you know obviously I see you're you're regularly posting things on LinkedIn. You've got your blogs that you like to post, and one thing you focus on a lot is unit testing. So that's something you can kind of tell us a bit more about and why you like to talk about it. Yeah. So one of the motivators that I already wanted to build out my freelance business before I joined Blue Green was that I wanted to share my knowledge. So I've been uh, 
going at it for a while now. Um, I've always been trying to be the expert in the room, meaning that I at least knew enough or more than the rest so that I could actually help them and, and move forward instead of standing still or moving backward. Um, but I never really had the priority or the time to properly um, uh, help larger groups, whether that's colleagues or project team members or even the community as a whole. I've always tried answering questions on yeah. Slack and on the forum, etc., but never really spent time on writing my knowledge down or, or sharing modules or, or stuff mm. like that because yeah, I was always working on an hourly basis and mm. if you're not working, then you're not getting any income. Yeah. Which is slightly different if you're with a, a larger group, of course. Plus there is a, the addition that marketing helps yes. the company forward, yeah. of course. Um, so I definitely wanted to share my knowledge. It's also something that I shared in my introductionary video when I joined Blue Green. Mm. And that's why I started the newsletter. Um, but one of my core uh, missing links in the Mendix platform and the Mendix development process has always been that you can develop things really fast, you can break them really fast, but you can't really validate that whatever you've developed is still working after mm. you broke a couple of other pieces. Uh, and of course, we started with UI testing, exploratory testing, automating the UI testing, but we never really went from the bottom up. The unit mm. testing module has existed for a long time, never really went further than the basics that were, was uh, developed like 10 years ago. Mm. I, I have to look it up if it's even older. Yeah. Um, and I've tried pushing this with some more major customers. Uh, XP Realty is one of the ones that actually uh, took it really seriously yeah. the last two years or so, which gave me the opportunity to, to together with them, um, revamp the unit testing module. Um, and I've also been working with uh, other like-minded community members in the background to try and push this agenda a little bit more so that we can't just develop fast, but can also yeah. validate fast and then keep quality at a, uh, a certain level that low code isn't just seen as, okay, it works nice for prototype. Yeah, sure, sure. And you know, do you get kind of, you know, obviously you've got the blogs and everything. Have you got anyone who's pushed back on your suggestions or how's the kind of interest in it? Um, not really pushback, more, um, okay, when can we use this module that you enhanced? Or yeah. can you write some more about this? The, Eternal debate um, edition in the unit testing uh, uh, series was inspired by a community member that came to mm -hmm. me and was like, well, all nice and well, and I understand the why and, and how, mm -hmm. etc. but I can't convince my uh, colleagues or the business to spend yeah. any time on this because they're all like, well, that's just a waste of time. It takes yeah. me so much effort and whatever. But can you dive into that a little bit? So it definitely helps to also send me your feedback and your comments and I've been spamming everyone around to get more input, of course, um, because writing uh, about topics that uh, are, are pressing or are on people's minds definitely yeah. help to, well, share the knowledge that's appropriate at that time. And, and I guess, you know, that's the whole point of the blogs to get that feedback and kind of that, that allows you to write other blogs to kind of answer those questions and kind of, you know, it's free advice is good advice, right? So every, everyone's yeah. happy with free advice. And so far it's all been fairly positive. I, I guess I've got one or two folks that didn't appreciate my spam and said, stop bothering me. But I mean, that's part of the process, right? I think yeah, every, everybody gets that. <laughs> and, you know, as you've worked, you know, you said from, was it 2.8? version two two point i think it was 2.5 two point five you know and you know all that time you've worked with the platform you know and is there you know over that time until now is there certain things that you know even you know we can talk about today that the platform you feel is not offering that you know you're obviously maybe giving feedback to mendex themselves or something you'd like to see in the future that can kind of be an offering that you can offer to customers there's always more to want, of course, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm still I wouldn't say annoyed, but frustrated by the fact that if I have to refactor and I have to rename a term of a bunch of times, that I can't do that with a flick of a switch, uh, essentially that I can do in pretty much any IDE that's high code based. Mm -hmm. 
And but this this one is especially frustrating because they tease this particular functionality at Mendix uh, World 2020 when we did it online with the extension. So I'm still hoping, or maybe I just have to take care of myself yeah. to now that we have the extensions available to to implement it. And I get why because I've worked with Mendix R&D and I know a little bit about the structure behind the scenes why that would be a difficult function to implement, even though it seems so rudimentary at the, at its core. Um, and other than that, there's always new features that anyone wants. I mean, we just recently got the uh, primary or primitive uh, attributes option to be passed from pages to nanoflows and microflows, which has existed for at least seven years, probably longer um, outside of the ID forum. Um, but a lot of stuff needed to be changed before that was possible. And there were other priorities that are important. And we, I understand that I'm a developer myself. I get similar questions from customers. Well, you can just add this checkbox, right? Mm -hmm. It's like five minutes of work. No, because this checkbox does a million things that you wanted to do properly. So it takes five weeks. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you've obviously worked on various projects, you know, throughout your time with Mendex. Is there one or two noteworthy projects that you know you're quite proud to be involved in that you can they can talk about and kind of tell us a bit about you know um what was built yeah. in the solution the, the, the most um long ongoing project definitely would be the xp realty one and i wouldn't say it's one project because i've done several projects so many, for this yeah. customer um but the reason why i find this one so interesting is because i i was there doing the inception um it was the ceo that recognized we have off the shelf software that's not keeping up with our growth we need to build something ourselves and he found mendix themselves which for a customer from the us even though mendix was pushing was still um wonderful but then the fact that he wanted to build out his own yeah. team from the get-go um and have uh, help from experts from outside not even from the US, but from the other side of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. It was an even uh, more interesting uh, scenario. And I've been involved with them for the past eight years. They've grown from having two people on the dev team and then a couple of people around it from business to uh, tens of uh, uh, folks that are on the development team, QA team, business teams, that are all involved in building their core infrastructure on Mendix. And there's obviously additional software now involved as well, because not everything should be done in Mendix, but there's still uh, highly important business critical processes that are flowing through there. And I was part of that team. I was part of the advisor, started as a builder, eventually uh, more of an architecture role. Um, and I've built several modules that are high code inspired mm. uh, for Mendix, which is, I, I could essentially do everything there with the exception of maybe native, because we yeah. don't have any native apps running mm -hmm. for their business model. Yeah, yeah. And how did you, you know, obviously that's that's like a, a customer is kind of, you know, I think it's good for you because obviously you started as such a small team and you've now watched that customer kind of grow and do other things. And I think we, we discussed online that few people I've spoken to on the podcast, you have you know, and, you know, you, you, you're there and you've seen them join. You know, how did you find when they were growing their team, obviously when they're hiring people in the U S that kind of, there wouldn't have been, most of them probably wouldn't be that experienced in Mendex. So what was, you know, did you have to have regular training or mentorship or kind of, you know, sessions with them to kind of bring them up to speed and how, how long was that process? Yeah. So, so they started off with just two developers that had, some high coding experience. No, mm. they hadn't heard of Mendix before their CEO said, well, let's go and do some yeah. Mendix and yeah. here's Mitchell, he's going to help you. Yeah. Um, we really early on with their ambitions recognized that that's, the, that's just going to be an issue in the beginning. I mean, they wanted to go extremely fast. They had a lot of work. So um, I introduced another Mendix partner that I have worked with in the past. They delivered a bunch of experts and we mm. built out the, the team essentially together. While we were uh, fulfilling the ambitions, we were also training them. They went on training to Boston um, and they started hiring their own folks. And in the beginning, they were actually fairly successful hiring folks that had at least some Mendix experience, hmm. pulling them away from former time series and, yeah. and other smaller Mendix uh, uh, customers. But yeah, at some point they actually had to train them. 
but as the team grew, there was more capacity to, to do the coaching, to do the training, and to just let them learn um, uh, on the job. Um, and they did attract a lot of folks that had either high code experience or some level of low code experience, yeah. which helped. Um, but there were definitely there that didn't have any background in it and mm. started off with low code and needed some more guidance than, I don't know, computer science major. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, as you're, you know, you're now part of Blue Green and you're talking to customers all the time. And you know, when, when you're speaking to customers, you know, especially someone who you understand both both sides, right? High code, low code. And how do you feel, you know, low code's kind of changed the landscape for customers and how do you kind of bring that to their attention, you know, when you're speaking to a potential new customer? Well, one of the interesting parts is that I always get the okay, how does this compare to high code? question and I, I did a comparison about that in one of my newsletters as well but also pretty much give the same answer to the customers i say you can do pretty much the same thing it's just that there is an upkeep fee when you're running but you get there way faster so i had a nice comparison conversation with a high coder uh, recently that said okay I, we have this app that just does some uh, basic uh, entry and then a form gets generated and a, cal a couple of calculations are made and then we do a doku sign integration how long do you expect it to us to build this or how long would you do that uh, need to build this event well considering all requirements are there the, the ui is there and it's not really did much different from general bootstrap um, uh, atlas ui design let's say anywhere between 50 and 100 hours. Um, and then he asked, how long did you think it took us to build this? Just building, not the requirements engineering, yeah. et cetera. It took them anywhere between 700 and 1,000 hours. And of course, after that, it's just some hosting and some general maintenance, et cetera. And that's considerably cheaper than the managed platform. But you pay for the license because they put in a lot of R&D to go yeah. there within 50 to 100 hours instead yeah. of 700 to 1,000. So you can start earning money from your solution much quicker. Plus, um, while they are very uh, design-oriented and they build everything out in Figma beforehand, um, we could do this, that directly in Mendix if we wanted to, instead of having to build it out separately. Yeah. Cool. And, you know, I'm interesting to see kind of their, their, obviously their reaction, because obviously I think, you know, you guys are a business is obviously trying to get projects globally, not just focused on the Netherlands. And I think in Netherlands, Mendex is so well known. So probably customers are probably not that surprised. So, you know, do you have kind of a different reaction to different regions? Yeah. So um, one of our more recent US customers that came to us, by the way, directly via the website, which we didn't expect at all. It's like a nice online uh, billboard but other than that yeah. we didn't expect any actual yeah. uh, business to come through it directly um, they must have seen one of your blogs or your, one of your posts you never know <laughs> maybe maybe you never know um and we we did it we usually do a small poc we do that whether that's a dutch customer that knows low code or mm -hmm. whether that is a, uh, a foreign customer that doesn't know too much about the power of it and um, we generally start with like a couple of hours of POC after a conversation and then build something out ourselves. And then we start building together with them while we're in a conversation. And they, that's when the sparks start flying generally because they're like, oh, you already applied that, that I just requested? How, how did you do that? Why is this so quickly done? And okay, so if we build this out for real, is it going to be as quickly as well? Yes. <laughs> um, so that's 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 how we try to convince them, not just by telling them or showing them nice visuals, but just really showing them. And I mean, you always have the demo effect that you're a little yeah. bit scared of, but we're also confident enough that um, our senior developers during pre-sales um, can show off the power of the platform. And I mean, in the end, most customers have their own special sauce, their IP, yeah. but they're all just moving boxes and their boxes are differently shaped and the contents is different and the steps it goes through is slightly different, but still boxes and, yeah, and they yeah. handles boxes really well. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, something that's kind of been the topic and it's in every conversation is AI, you know, and I'm, I'm keen to hear kind of your views on AI and what you think the future looks like. But also if you, if you're, you know, existing customers are also asking you 
things about you know AI and you know obviously there's this conversation about AI versus low code. What's going to happen? I'm I'm keen to hear your views on that. I'd say it's a it's a it's a proper next evolutionary step. Uh, and while most of the uh, large language models out there like ChatGPT and Copilot don't really know Mendix that well yet because mm. their data set on the subject probably is too small. Um, having AI help you develop um, quality driven proper code would probably um, just speed things up even more. I don't think we're going to be replaced whether that's high coders or, uh, or low coders anytime soon yet, especially because well, business folks still don't know how to explain what they want, um, let alone how they want it. Mm. Um, and you need some sort of translating factor in there for at least the foreseeable years until we've trained uh, AI enough on our skill set that we can say bye bye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think then we'll find something else that we can fill the gap that machines can't. I mean, we've always done that during the industrial revolution, during the revolution of low code. Um, we can produce more with the um, little resources that we have, and there are just not enough developers. We tried citizen development, it yeah. kind of bombed. Um, and I think that's the area in which we would lack if we would just give it over to AI right now as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and you mentioned citizen development, and I'm, I'm you know, I'd like to know your, your views on that. Obviously, you know, you're someone who comes from traditional background and you know there's this thing that you know you know these low code platforms it's it's quite easy for someone with the non it background to pick it up and start developing but what you know as someone who's kind of been in tech pretty much all their you know professional career what's your view on that you know i think i think there's definitely room also to diversify um, I, I would say that if you get into a certain level of complexity or um, uh, long-term development, uh, knowing the basics of how software works, like in a working of a database and uh, communications with REST and, and, and logic, etc., cetera, um, does help because otherwise you're just pretty much wasting hardware resources, even though they live on someone else's server cluster in the cloud, they still cost money. Um, and making optimized quality code, we, in my opinion, still requires uh, knowing the basics, basic principles of software. Um, you, th those can be taught, um, but it also helps if you have some level of background in, in engineering. That doesn't have to be IT, uh, but I've noticed that people with a major in psychology have a different brain. It's wired mm. differently and it's more difficult for them generally, there are exceptions of course, to pick up on the uh, intricacies of building software and the, the type of wiring that software developers have. Um, but if you're motivated, if you uh, bring yourself to it, if you have great mentors, it's definitely achievable. But I don't think that's per se 100% on the account of low code. I do think that low code helps you in starting up, um, but it might also mask things that you generally would be um, um, falling over when you're doing the high code, which is, um, I mean, learning curve is a little bit more steeper, but it also means that you generally get pushed into the proper direction. Yeah, I guess it, it definitely gets you going a lot quicker. Like you said, you know, it can get you started, but then also what we found is, it's also up to the individual how much they're willing to put in yeah. themselves, you know, and like you said, find a good mentor or something like that, you know, um, that you can kind of stick with and keep, you know, and doing kind of outside, you know, courses or anything else to kind of upskill yourself to really understand the work you're, you're, you're delivering. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, you're quite involved in the Mendex community, you know, and kind of, you know, involved in meetups and the blogs and things like that, you know, how does that differ, the Mendex community differ from, you know, your experience with the high code community? I would definitely say that in terms of community, I feel way more bonded with my um, fellow Mendix developers. Um, also, thanks to a, a, a really nice community team that instigated the meetups that built online communities, even during Corona, there was still a lot of uh, uh, mingling, um, yeah. whether 
online, be online via webinars or we even try online meetups that didn't work really well. But I mean, there was still knowledge sharing. Yeah. Um, and I think it also helps that I live in the country where it originates from um, yeah. and where it started and where they were pushing um, a lot on the mending front. But with high code, I mean, I never met uh, a lot of Java, .NET, Cold Fusion developers in real life. Um, I, I occasionally read things from the same folks on Stack yeah. Overflow, but that's about it. Um, and that, that will definitely feel different when you're, I don't know, trying to build out a managed community in Australia, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, for uh, for me, it's definitely a part of the success of Mendix and part of my drive to share back to the community has been the mm -hmm. fact that the community feels so strong. Yeah, yeah. And because you've been involved in the community for so long, you're kind of, you've been there, obviously, you know, pre-Siemens and post-Siemens, you know, did uh, did you feel, when that kind of went through, how, was there a shift in the community, like a big change, you know, obviously, I think, was that before the pandemic, just before the pandemic, maybe? Just before the pandemic, yeah. yeah. 20, so, 20, 20. so did you feel um, the community kind of grow, expandly, kind of quite a bit? It, it grew quite a bit because all of a sudden everyone within Siemens also could push to start using Mendix. Mm -hmm. um, initially, it grew mostly by uh, a lot of folks that had no idea what it was or how to use it and asked all the basic questions. And there yeah. were a lot of, was a lot of stuff on the forum that, could have been answered by just taking a look at the documentation. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that having a more broader global exposure, and recently I was at a MTP 2.0 meetup where they said, okay, we have exposure left and right. And then obviously the Netherlands lights up like a light bulb and yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't have anyone in Southern America yet. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The work to be done there. Um, but there's, it's definitely growing, and uh, I, I, I would say without Siemens, Mendix couldn't have had the exposure that it has today, or it would have taken them quite a bit longer. Longer, and that's yeah. Not just in getting new customers, but also in the community. Yeah, yeah. And you know, as someone, you know, you, you may have you may have had conversations, or just your view in general. You know, there's people in traditional are still quite, you know, not fans of low code. You know. I'm not sure if you because you're a high coder from before if you've got people in your network who still believe that but what would be your message to those who kind of don't believe in low code and you know what what it can deliver i would say let's not be try to be biased whether you are a high coder or a low coder try to see and uh, the other's perspective and i mean the whole platform is enabled because there are high coders working on a low code platform i mean somebody has to build all that scala yeah, and yeah. that and uh, Java code to uh, to make it run at all. Um, I would I would say just try it out. Uh, it's it's how I roll into it. And obviously, I had a I had a goal, I had a project I was working on, and I had great mentors to show me around how it works and how you can do things as efficiently as possible. Um, but because the learning curve is relatively low, and you already know high code, you already know how to develop code. Um, just give it a go. Um, every time I show it, they are semi-impressed, but there's always, okay, but can I do this? And um, isn't it limited in this way? And I think much of the um, reactions come from knowing that, I don't know, Salesforce can be extended a little bit with something they call low code as well, but those are more of a configurational or um, limited set towards the platform that you're already working on, while systems like uh, Mendix and even our systems can build complete apps from mm. scratch with a lot of uh, modules and available tools to speed that up significantly. And I wouldn't say that replaces high code altogether because there are definitely systems that can be built better yeah. in high code. Mendix, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you get Inception. Um, but yeah, just try it out. That's before you uh, before you hate it. At least try it. I mean, I have a four year old, and he says he doesn't like any food. Uh, at least take one bite. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do that with all three kids. It definitely works. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, with, with the traditional side, obviously. 
we get a lot of people who might say things like, okay, if I, if I switched, I'm going to lose my level of experience. Kind of, you know, I've got 10 years Java. I'm going to, my level of, like when I enter low code, I'll be entering like a mid-level junior kind of low code developer. As someone who's done it, would you agree that, you know, um, if you've got that experience, you can come in and be a senior, just like people with five, six years low code experience straight away? You, you, you probably wouldn't be a senior straight away because you oh. do need to learn the tools and the intricacies of it. Yeah. But um, I was a meteor developer when I joined the, the low code mm. the game. And seniority comes not just from knowing the code, uh, expertise in your area of field, of yeah. course, does. Um, but seniority comes also from being able to coach your um, uh, team members, being able to analyze the requirements properly, um, having talks with customers at all, consultancy mm -hmm. work, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and that won't go away unless you always were in a, a dark room, just coding away whatever yeah, requirements yeah. given yeah. to you by a business analyst. Um, and again, knowing the basic principles and probably far more of software development will definitely help you speed up a lot compared to any junior starting off fresh uh, yeah. with a low code platform because you're still doing the exact same thing. It's just a different tool. It will, in my opinion, it would be pretty much the same as if you would switch from Java to PHP or something like that, mm. which is too high codes and yeah. you don't blink an eye about that either. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, as a kind of final note, you know, is there kind of, you know, any kind of, you know, aspirations for you and obviously goals or things we can look forward to for blue green solutions in the future yeah i've been building a lot of um applications to spec on an hourly basis for anyone out there didn't really care what kind of company they were whether they were retail uh real estate uh, automated automotive uh, finance or whatever um, but now with uh, Blue Green Solutions, we're also trying to expand into well, recurring revenue for obvious yeah. reasons. Um, and we're trying to just build uh, standard solutions with the Mendix uh, uh, platform on mm -hmm. top of like APAS or Microsoft Dynamics or yeah. SAP or whatever. And then just having a really nice uh, uh, standardized solution that everybody needs. Uh, we all know how difficult it can be sometimes mm -hmm. to write our hours or have our reimbursements or uh, our trip uh, registrations. Now we, we build a solution for that now yeah, just yeah. for Apple's, but that's because of our uh, connections in our network. Um, but building something that you design yourself together with your colleagues and then uh, optimize it uh, completely, that's currently my aspiration next to obviously still sharing as much of yeah. uh, my knowledge as I have, because I still have a ton to share. The list is very long. Also yeah. thanks to the feedback that I've gotten. Yeah. Um, and with tech ventures and blue green solutions, I think we have the possibility to work that out. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I look forward to um, following your, your post going forward. Um, I and, I, do. and I appreciate <laughs> you taking the time. Thank you very much for Thanks, us. Thanks, Maybe we speak again in the future and see where things have gone. We will. We will. Sounds good. Thanks, Mitchell. Thank you for listening to today's episode, which is brought to you by iTrack. We are a leading staffing firm that solely specializes in supplying both contract and permanent low-code professionals to organizations globally. Navigating the niche landscape of the low-code market requires the best talent, and we recognize its critical importance for our clients. Whether you're a company looking to strengthen your team, an individual seeking the next career move, or someone entirely new to the world of low-code, we're here for you. Our extensive experience and in-depth market knowledge enables us to quickly pinpoint the ideal candidates while offering expert advice and support at every stage of your low-code journey. Reach out to us through our website or connect with me directly on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to assist you. Thank you once again for joining us today. We'll be back next week with another insightful episode. Until then, take care.